I'm Liz DuPlessis, the Instructional Designer in Distance Education at Santa Rosa Junior College. SRJC faculty Scott Snyder invited us to his face-to-face -face emergency medical technician class in which he uses case-based learning. First, he explains why he flipped his class by replacing lectures with problem-solving activities. Then he shares his resources in Canvas that students access before each class to prepare for the hands-on work. He also describes how he facilitates in-class activities with the help of volunteer TAs, including former students who have formed a culture of enthusiasm for case-based learning. Here's Scott. I want to first talk about why I engage in case-based learning in the classroom and why I think it's, it's, it's important, especially for the cohort of people, students I work with. Um, we're, you know, we're presented with the unique fact that our students, after taking a one-semester EMT course, are employable. So they're going to leave our course and go out into the workforce and start treating people. So that puts a lot of pressure on us in the classroom to help them develop skills, and specifically critical thinking skills that will benefit them in the work environment You know, three or four months down the line. Um, and as a result of that, what I consider to be pressure to, to produce people who could think critically and enter the workforce and be successful, um, I found myself moving away from lecturing in class and moving more to case-based learning and, and uh, problem solving in the classroom so they can learn skills such as intercommunication with, with team members and other partners in healthcare, um, working through problems together with a group of people, uh, the ability to, to actually develop the uh, the skill of asking for help in the first place when they don't understand something um, and then listening to other people taking in other opinions and other thought processes making a decision and moving on um, and i found that case-based learning helped them do that uh, so to, to an important component of, of that process in the classroom though is setting them up ahead of time to actually be able to work their way through classes during the class period and at the end of the day they have to do their work if they're not preparing before class they cannot come in and contribute to the group effort of working their way through a, uh, through a case. So in a sense, the book work, the foundational material, needs to be mastered before they come into the classroom. And during the, during the evolution through a case, they'll apply that book work you know, to, the, uh, to the case itself. So every student is required to you know, read the chapter and also take a pre-class quiz before every classroom session so that they're prepared to enter in the casework. Um, and then after class, they actually take a post-class quiz as well that reinforces what we did in the classroom. So my instructions to my students are very simple. Read the, ch the relevant chapters for that day. Take your pre-class quiz so you're prepared to come to the classroom. And the funny thing is, it's a combination of grade pressure because the pre-class pre quizzes count towards their final grade and, quite frankly, peer pressure that help achieve my goal of getting them to do their work. Because when they don't do their work and they're sitting at a table with their peers, very quickly the, their peers figure out that they cannot contribute to the conversation because they haven't done their work. And there's a little bit of pressure that comes along with that. So it's a, And I find the peer pressure is probably more effective than the grade pressure. Okay, so let's go to a, a day where we did some cases and we'll take a look at uh, what that material looks like. So... Session 16, I had them read chapters 35 and 32. Chapter 35 was a head injury chapter. Chapter 32 covered burns. So they did their pre-class quizzes. They came to class. And then we actually did some quick cases. All right. And I asked the students to print this material out beforehand so that they actually have it on paper in front of them. Um, I find that they make great notes after class. Um, for the students, they can actually take notes on the paper itself while they're working through the cases with their uh, fellow students, and that allows them to uh, use it as a resource down the line. So a typical case is just like it appears here. It gives them uh, some information that they need to be able to make decisions. Um, I also follow up with some questions afterwards, and that's meant to guide them. You know, we have a very specific way that we engage in a patient evaluation. Um, and I force them to actually talk about it. Nothing can ever be taken for granted. Yeah, her airway breathing and circulation is fine. Let's get on to the interesting part. But as a student, I make them talk about why things are fine. Um, it's not enough simply to say, 
yeah, it appears to be fine. Because what happens is everyone in the group shakes their head and says, oh, yeah, everything's fine. But yet half of them don't know why it's fine. So I force them to say things like, well, the patient's, the patient's airway is open. is because she's talking and there's no gurgling, snoring, or strider. Okay, so that's good. The patient is breathing and it's a normal rate and tidal volume. But, uh, and the patient has an SpO2 of 97%, so their oxygenation is good, but I also see that they're altered. So maybe we'll give them some oxygen. And that opens up the discussion of, well, how much oxygen? How many liters per minute? What uh, delivery device are they going to use? Do they need to ventilate the patient? And it starts up this whole conversation about what they're going to do and why, and then they have to justify it to each other. Um, and that's where all the learning takes place. Each group, we call them squads, each squad has their own uh, marker board that they use and they keep track of their progress. And we have a methodology that we employ in class that each group will sort of base their uh, summations as they move through the case. They'll write that down on the board. They also have a treatment area. They'll write their treatment. So at any given time, I can look around the classroom and I know exactly what each group is doing and how they're progressing. Um, I'm listening, I'm walking around, I'm also listening in and chiming in and steering them in the right direction when necessary. But I can look around the room at any given point and see where people are and how things are progressing. And if something doesn't look good, I can walk over and pay a little bit more attention to them and, and help guide them down the proper path. Um, and at the end of the case, um, the case is over when basically everyone gets to where we need them to be. Um, it usually takes about 10 minutes for each of these quick cases. I'll, uh, I'll stop the group work and then we'll have a very quick um, sort of recap of the case. I have a PowerPoint presentation that highlights the points that I want to emphasize um, and I'll wrap up the case for them and then we move on to the next one. I have to stay focused and I have to know exactly what my goal is to cover it and I have to keep myself from talking too much and that's, that's the problem. What I love teaching with case-based learning so much is like I don't have to talk about burn center criteria. I simply put the document into Canvas, I make them print it out and bring it to class, and at no point do I go through that document and sit there and talk about every criteria there is for sending a patient to a burn center. I simply tell them, your responsibility is to download that document, look at that list, have it memorized. Um, you come to class learn, ready to apply that. And for each burn case, they have to state whether or not that patient meets burn center criteria. So if the answer is no, well, okay, well, they didn't meet any. But if the answer is yes, they have, to let, they have to be able to verbalize exactly which criteria they met. So this is a lot of work, actually. You know, I have to have up to 32 students separated into four groups in the classroom um, and for one person to handle. So actually, I would not be able to do this if I didn't have teaching assistants. So I have volunteer teaching assistants who come in and help me every day in class. And uh, the, I've had some teaching assistants who have been working with me for as long as eight years. Okay, so they know this material about as well as I do at this point. And some of my teaching assistants are students from the previous class or maybe from two class cycles ago. All right, but they're all students who have gone through my class. They're familiar with the process. So every teaching assistant is given basically a cheat sheet. And I have a Dropbox that is for the teaching assistants. So all the materials that we're covering in any particular day or in the Dropbox. And I just do it by sessions that line up with the sessions in Canvas. Okay, So my TA for this day, for the head trauma, for instance, had the teaching assistant version with the answers for, or the best answer choices, where I wanted the students to be steered towards for each of the cases. And their job is just to make sure that the students end up here. And it's not a mini lecture. Um, the teaching assistants are actually facilitators. They facilitate the group discussion. Their job is to not say a word if it's not necessary. Their job is to make sure that the students are engaging in the process in the order that we want them to, uh, using the methodology that we want them to, making sure that they're staying focused because a lot of times in case-based learning um, conversations can get started, which are great conversations, but they're just getting away from our goal. and We have a limited amount of time, so the, the teaching assistant's job is to bring them back towards the goal that we're, we're trying to achieve in that 10 minutes that we're doing this. Um, their job is also to make sure that what is being said is factually correct. And if something is incorrect, um, that it gets identified and corrected because we don't want students hearing things thinking they're true and when they're not. Um, but sort of that's the end game. Um, these are the answers. These are the endpoints that we're looking for the students to get to. And the teaching assistant's job is to constantly steer them towards these endpoints so that we get there. And then I'll do a final wrap up of 
at the end of it. This is a low energy, stab wound is low energy trauma, not like being kicked in the chest where you might get transfer of energy in a pulmonary. Search for SRJC Distance Education on YouTube to find more videos, like them, subscribe, and add comments. Thanks for watching.